morning, everyone. I really appreciate you joining today's session. Uh, once again, it's around the topic of the hidden value of single sign-on. So today we're going to cover a primer on workforce single sign-on and how it generally works, how SSO, the abbreviated version of single sign-on, enables you to balance access control with end-user productivity, We'll talk about how modern web-based applications have evolved in a cloud-first world. And also we'll talk a little bit about how to ensure SSO is aligned to your zero trust information security strategy. And last but not least, we'll provide some tips on how to drive profitability as a managed services provider. So before we get started, let's start with a poll. So the question that you should see on your screen is, uh, what percentage of your end customers have a hybrid and or fully remote workforce? All right, folks are answering questions. We'll give it a moment. All right. Oh, this is great. We're seeing really high numbers. Great on. Give it another moment. I think we got it. Usually we try to get to 80%, but we've got it. All right, so hopefully you can see the results. We have the majority of landing in the 51% or above range, which is pretty much the industry standard for SMB and enterprise. So it's not surprising. It's uh, consistent with what we see in other research as well. So with that as a background, um, we're going to talk a little bit more about those hybrid and remote use cases and, and uh, having those in mind and uh, get into the primer now. All right, so what is Workforce SSO? In general, access management are tools that establish, enforce, and manage journeys or ceremonies for access control to cloud apps, mobile apps, modern web apps, and legacy web apps. In this context, Workforce Access Management is single sign-on as an authentication method that enables workforce users to sign in with one set of credentials to multiple independent applications and target systems. Using SSO eliminates the need for a user to have to sign in and out with a unique set of credentials for every application or target system that they're provisioned to use. An SSO ceremony typically is comprised of three parts, and this is how it really generally works. There's an identity provider, which is responsible for user credentials and validating authentication requests before granting an access token. There's a service provider role, which in this context can be an application, a portal, or that target system that the user will initiate an authentication request to use. And in the back, there's a token provider, which exchanges the request between the service provider and the identity provider on behalf of the user to issue and validate access tokens. So it acts in a sense like a proxy on behalf of the user to give you access to multiple potential applications that are enabled. And one of the reasons we're having this session today on World Identity Management Day is that there's new guidance from cyber agencies nationally here in the US in particular. Some of the new guidance that's come about is from CISA and NSA, and it doesn't mean that you have to be uh, an agency or um, a, a service provider that uh, serves federal government or state and local government or national governments of any type. It's good guidance for MSPs because you are the administrators for your end customers. And as such, there was this new guidance published late last year around identity and access management recommended best practices for administrators. So previously I described sort of the generalized uh, term of workforce or workplace employees. And in this example, we're gonna dig a little deeper into the administrator role within an organization. And sometimes that administrator is actually you, the managed service provider. So the guidance specifically addresses the technology gaps that limit the adoption and the secure use of both multi-factor and single sign-on technologies within organizations. It provides recommendations applicable to both enterprise and smaller organizations. And that's really key here is that 
A technology like MFA or single sign-on can be right-sized to serve the needs of any sized organization. It's really not a set of technologies or access management technologies that is only intended for, say, large organizations or governments. So there's a link here in the um, presentation and you can get the PDF yourself, but I'm gonna just walk through some of the actions that are recommended through this guidance. Um, assess your organization's internal and on-premises applications, devices, platforms, and your cloud provider's ability to connect using SSO. So we at WatchGuard have WatchGuard Cloud as our unified security platform, and we enable SSO through that platform, as well as for you to be able to enable it for your organization as an MSP. And then you can also continue to drive value into your end customers by deploying SSO to them and their ability to get access to applications as well. So we're gonna talk about it in both contexts today, how you should be using it as an MSP and how you should be selling it and supporting it as an MSP for your end customers. So the second uh, action to take here is to, de to determine if your SSO integrations can collect user context during the SSO logins, including location, device, and behavioral uh, attributes. So we'll talk a little bit about how we do that at WatchGuard and, and, and specifically how we do this with our MFA product coupled with SSO. And the third action to take here is that organizations should develop and deploy SSO friendly applications and platforms to eliminate all local accounts and identities. Local accounts meaning admin privileges that shouldn't be on a system or within an application because they're they're not necessary to be there. And so in this example, we'll also talk a little bit about those friendly applications as well and which ones are very popular for businesses today. Um, in conclusion, there's some benefits that are provided, and in doing so, this is sort of some universal truths about SSO. Um, by deploying SSO and enabling SSO, you get this balance of improved user experience while significantly reducing the risk associated to things like admin local accounts, which are difficult to manage and monitor. And really the guidance here is that local admin accounts that use shared passwords in particular create legal and forensic issues for organizations, especially if they're attempting to identify an attacker's identity because it's virtually unknown to them. So in summary, SSO can help organizations in a number of ways. And we've talked about this more at the point of view of the risk piece, but really there's pro the problems that SSO can help are include things like time savings, uh, user satisfaction, and then at the end of the day, TCO, total cost of uh, ownership for organizations as well. So we have some fun facts here around the average number of apps used daily, um, somewhere between five and 20, and that's a lot of coffee breaks. So if I had to start my day today and log into anywhere from five to 20 applications that I use either on a regular daily basis or throughout the week, that's gonna be a significant amount of my time and your time and everyone's time when you really add it all up, um, we, we could be using your time better by having SSO and not really giving much thought to each individual login ceremony and session that we have to establish in order to start our day. Um, the average number of passwords as a result of having all those individual applications that we use um, also of course correlates. The idea here is to not have bad password habits and reuse passwords across multiple applications because the bad actors figure that out pretty quickly and that's how credential based breaches occur often. Um, so really there's also this SAT experience that is frustrating, but it also uh, results in bad password habits as well from an end user perspective. And last but not least, um, you know, password resets drive call that, called uh, desk volume, as well as you have to have a secondary system in order to be able to manage all those password resets. Each application has a different experience and pretty quickly users start to have those bad ha password habits as well, in which they try to reuse the same passwords over and over again, or just append with an exclamation mark or a uh, numeral at the end. And over time, eventually those passwords are not allowed to be used anymore and can often trigger another password reset or another call to the help desk. So with that in mind, we're gonna take another poll. All right, so in this poll, this question pivots a little bit towards whether or not your end customers have some contractors or vendors, essentially non-employees that require temporary or project-based access.
right on. Here we go. See some responses coming in. We're going to try to just get up to that 80%. We're close. Trying to get over 70. We slowed down. Okay, there's a lot of I don't knows, but there's some good yeses here. All right. All right, so we've we've gotten past the 80% mark of voting. Thank you everyone for participating. All right, so this is an important use case because of the apps. And of course, sometimes the apps are actually repositories like Box or Dropbox, which manage data, whether it's documents or spreadsheets or what have you. So we're gonna take a look at some of the most common applications as I sort of uh, teed up in the beginning that we see they're excellent candidates for single sign-on. And it's irrespective of whether you have uh, just workforce employees that need access because of that hybrid and remote use case, or if you have a set of um, external users that you know aren't employees, but they still need access to certain applications for those time-based projects. All right, so these are the top 10 applications that we see the vast majority of organizations uh, leveraging for single sign-on experiences because, again, they're used with a lot of frequency as well as daily and by a number of users. So really, there's uh, efficiencies to be gained in not having to literally create a user, an account for every individual user within an organization. So this includes cloud platforms, which of course come with extreme resource uh, capabilities. And this can be very risky, especially if we talk about those admin accounts or those tenant or cloud admin accounts for Azure and Google, for example, or AWS. Um, and then you have the classic SaaS apps from Adobe, and uh, of course, uh, Zoom, and today we're using uh, GoToWebinar, um, as well as uh, productivity applications and CRM systems like Salesforce and Google Workspace. Of course, the big, uh, big application is Microsoft 365, so that's the most popular application by all. So we really selected that would be the number one application, and these are the remaining top 10. Um, so what makes it really critical here is that these are not just applications that have sort of a one-to-one -one, uh, user experience. They're often collaboration platforms in which there's uh, storage. And as our poll reflects, there are needs for people outside of the organization to be able to participate. And in recent years, SSO has been changing from a sort of inside the perimeter to get outside to SSO applications to externalizing identities in cloud identity directories and now creating much more of a distributed experience in which you can actually use a more modern approach to uh, federation and to single sign-on. So we're going to take a deeper look. This is where we get a little bit more technical. All right, so so one of the many difficulties faced by organizations has been how to create that portability, reusability, and interoperability of digital identities. And it's really from getting to that on-premises realm that I've mentioned and the increasingly uh, popularity of web services enabled environments. So again, this is somewhat pre-cloud in this discussion. It was really sort of the early beginnings. So one of the earliest and most widely adopted approaches has been SAML, which is called Security Assertion Markup Language. And it's based on an XML scheme and then Identity Federation. <clears throat> so let's start with Identity Federation. Identity federation is the notion of portability and reusability of digital identities. The ultimate goal is to enable users from one domain to securely access applications, data systems in a seamless way without redundant user management. Just like SAML, Web Services Federation or WS Fed is a standardized way to ensure that the mechanisms to allow different realms to federate. So, both SAML and Identity Federation have served an important role in workforce access management up until now. However, neither specify the method of authentication to be used by the identity provider. And that's why MFA is such an important tool on top of SSO. Otherwise, you have risks like what they call a SAML golden ticket, because it can provide you with uh, excessive access, especially if you're going into an environment or having using unilateral access of SSO across domains within your own company, you can actually cross. It's not it's not a great zero trust formula for success. So 
uh, as we have entered the cloud era, as well as um, the sort of new development paradigms, there is a missing piece of uh, the identity layer that has now been created. So as developers rapidly begin began to create and build a public cloud infrastructure on mobile platforms, it became clear that the complexities of identity federation could be solved without any on-premises realms. So born out of the necessity to create that missing identity layer for the internet, again, think about no perimeter, not using your network security as the uh, defense. Um, the idea here is that you could externalize your identities from your organization and still get all the benefits of uh, the access control that you need. So um, that began a journey called uh, OpenID, and it, it built off of the creation of something called OAuth, which is Open Authorization, an industry standard protocol for authorization. So OAuth focuses on client developer simplicity while providing specific authorization flows for web applications, desktop applications, mobile phones, many other types of connected devices. And so you can see here, we've, we've shifted the mindset away from some of that authentication language and really more around authorization. Authentication being, who are you? prove the validity of you as the user to authorization what you can do now that you've met the criteria to prove who you are. So the advancement of authorization was followed by a, a, a really cool creation called OpenID Connect. So OpenID Connect is a federation protocol built on the OAuth 2.0 framework. It enables web services to externalize authentication functions to a third party and enables clients to corroborate the identity of an end user based on authentications performed by authorization servers. So it can also provide basic profile information and uh, about the end user in an interoperable and what's known as JSON RESTful manner. So this is really the ability for both authentication and authorization to be offloaded to an identity provider like us at WatchGuard, for example, or any other cloud directory that is enabled with uh, this capability. And it also ensures that you don't write authentication authorization logic into every application, which was the previous generation of realms that existed, especially on premises. You had to have a, an account created for every individual, which then of course created the need to have a password for every individual. Um, so why is OpenID important? And really this has been written about a lot and it's well known in, within our industry. And I'm a member of the OpenID Foundation and, uh, and an evangelist for open uh, standards in general, um, but it's really important because it enables application owners and developers to authenticate those human users across applications and websites without having to create, manage, and maintain identities. And since the vast majority of data breaches involve credentials, not just credentials used to perform the breach, but the data that gets dumped in the dark web contains credential information, if you don't need to collect it in your application or service, you shouldn't and you should re use identities. And you see this every day um, when you use your uh, consumer experiences, whether you sign in with your Apple ID or you're signing in with your Gmail. Um, that is a version of federation done at the consumer level. And it's that exact same technology and capability that's possible with OpenID Connect to do that with your own domain, within your own domain of applications and your own company domain, really. So with OpenID Connect, you can provide that single sign-on experience using those existing enterprise credentials, or as I mentioned, social accounts, um, to access applications and improve your usability, security, and it includes privacy enhancing features, as we've talked about, this ability to have a profile, only certain attributes from that profile can go to the application or service provider. And that's within the user's control as well, in most cases. So that consent management that I just described can support hybrid and multi-cloud environments. It also supports more client types than the previous developed federation protocols that I mentioned. Um, it's also an improved user experience. Many times things that start in consumer experiences 
uh, help us all get familiar with how to use them and similar with biometrics like touch and face ID um, have now become part of our norm and, and we use them every single day. And so this is the same sort of scenario where you've been using all these different mobile apps, reusing your Gmail, reusing your Apple ID, and you've been able to have this great seamless experience. You don't really think about it as single sign-on or federation, but when you go to work, then you have this experience where you're not uh, having the same sign-in experience and now realize you can through support like OpenID Connect for the workforce. So this improved user experience, lightweight authentication authorization, this fine grained consent management, and the ability to add that verification with MFA. It's really important, um, again, that it's not just username or credential with the password. You really do need to front it uh, with uh, some verification step to prove that you are the valid user before you move into those authorization flows. And what's also key here is that OIDC is a full, uh, full place replacement for SAML going forward. It doesn't mean that SAML's end of life or that it won't be supported. In fact, there's still um, work being done in the industry, in the, in the standards community to improve the SAML profile because it is really challenging to use given that it's based on the XML schema. But um, really, as you think about new applications or many of the top 10 that we've talked about today, um, they support both protocols and so really over time you can make the decision of which of the protocols you want to implement and uh, support for your for your customers at the end of the day so now that we've covered how SSO to modern web-based applications has evolved let's cover how SSO should be aligned to that zero trust security strategy and so I'm actually going to go through a couple of screens here that really show how our product works just for demonstration purposes so before you would have gotten to this step of our OffPoint product, um, so we have two OffPoint products. One is called OffPoint MFA, and it includes the capability to do SSO and uh, have an application portal. We also have a second product that we launched last year called Total Identity Security. It includes MFA and SSO, as well as other key features like dark web credential monitoring and a password manager. So either product that we have uh, supports SSO. It's included in, in the package, and so you would have set up as a managed service provider the identity provider um, component to this so this would be immediately after you've established that federation that we talked about um, from when within the um, offpoint administration um, you would actually quickly create and configure an application portal this is a portal that allows you to place all the applications that you have enabled with whatever protocol whether you use saml or open id connect uh, for your users and so this is an area where you can customize the name of the application portal for your company that you support you can use it as a managed service provider within your own company we also enable you to do that um, you can name it and then you can also select select features that will show up in the portal. And one example here is to allow users to manage tokens from the IDP portal. So once you're actually in the experience, if you want to uh, just have users using the application portal, like the example I gave with um, contractors and temporary uh, vendors, for example, where they shouldn't have access to anything on premises or even your, you don't support them with laptops, but you do want them to be able to use key applications. This is an example of where they could activate an MFA token in order to be able to um, get into the application portal and just use the portal based on specific applications that you want to grant them access to for that project, for example. We also see this used um, a lot in education where students use the portal for online classes, but faculty will have a more robust um, set of, of applications that include the grading system and other things that the students shouldn't see. Um, and so we'll, you're able to have two different experiences, one for the faculty and the professors and whatnot, and one really for the students that's really targeted just to the students being able to complete online uh, curriculum. So that's really why you start to think about these application portals as really productivity um, plays for these organizations. There's a the security benefit, of course, but there's really a big productivity benefit that you get from um, using these types of application portals to manage your access control. So from there, you're able to configure specifically how you want somebody to log in. This is all customizable. Again, I'm just showing you that we have the WatchGuard logo here today, but this is customizable to your company or your co 
the companies you support, and you're able to set a very specific set of, of uh, login expectations. Again, this speaks to the verification steps of MFA. And so within uh, the the policy that you set for this portal, you can select exactly what authentication options are supported. It's any combination of password plus push, password plus QR code, or password plus TOTP, for example. And you can also uh, opt in to include the forgot password and forgot token here so that you can, again, create an environment in which uh, sets of users do not have to be on premises or use an on premises identity system in order for them to be productive. So, with that, we'll talk a little bit more about how this applies to SSO. So, the, the first part is always verify with SSO. You should never, you should never implicitly trust the user is who they say they are just because they know the secret, meaning the password. And so that's the really important first step when it comes to your zero trust information security is always verify the user. And that this is really how you're going to do it, whether it's through push QR code or a TOTP ceremony. Separately from that, um, earlier I, uh, we talked a little bit about some of the expectations that you should start assessing whether or not your technology provider includes things like uh, location or um, schedule or device attributes associated to um, how they're going to know who is really logging in. These are additional attributes that we can perform checks against to make sure Nothing anom anomalous has changed since maybe the last time that you um, signed in. So context matters. And so in our case, we pro have provided risk-based zero trust policies out of the box for our MFA product. And so you can set these policy objects to be very constrained around um, a geography like North America, for example. So you will not allow any incoming logins coming from Asia or from uh, South America, for example, or uh, you could probably get down to a very specific area like Russia. Um, in terms of working hours, I've, I've mentioned, mentioned the fact that we have the potential to support um, contractors and vendors, and often they are not salaried employees, so they don't work weekends, as an example. So you can limit the fact that a contractor or a vendor cannot log in over a weekend, for example, which is exactly what an adversary would attempt to try to trick a user to do, knowing that they're busy, it's a weekend, they think their you know, con employer who's been contracting with them needs something, so they might just uh, in error, log in and fall susceptible to a phishing attempt. And so really these time-based policies, as an example, or working hours policies, as we call them, really help ensure that there isn't access possible um, during hours where really there's no business reason for this individual to be logging in. And so it's, it's likely going to be something that you don't want to see occur. And then we have other abilities around uh, devices, around uh, this idea of impossible travels, we call it uh, geokinetics, where the individual's laptop is in no way potentially in the proximity of the mobile device in which that token for verification is being sent to prove the validity of the user. And so when you're able to do uh, certain mathematical uh, calculations, if uh, if my phone was in Seattle and I'm in Portland, there's really no way for me to have gotten in those two locations uh, without it being a three to four hour drive or at least one hour of travel by air for as an example. So chances are that it is not me verifying, requesting access or verify access. So I'm not involved in one of those ceremonies and you can prevent that type of uh, unfortunate access from occurring uh, in the event of, you know, that it's actually unauthorized. So with those three examples as backdrop of how you get to a really great uh, look and feel for an application portal, this is what the new uh, AuthPoint application portal looks like. I've put a few applications in here that we use every day. Um, we have a Conquer Travel, we have Envoy for when people come into our space and need to register themselves as guests. So you can see that there's use here for both internal employees as well as for guests that might come to one of our offices and need to get a temporary pass in order to have a meeting with someone. Um, I'm also showing here on the screen um, that earlier screen where you could um, 
configure the mobile token and the hardware tokens. We also sell hardware tokens for users that don't want to use their mobile device. Um, and that's an, a, a way where you can have these non-employees or in the example with uh, faculty versus students using just the portal. And they're not encumbered at all with having to log into um, any of your corporate workforce environment, any of your networks that you have, or any of your branch offices that you might support, for example. All right, we're gonna move forward now and just summarize up all the productivity and management benefits of SSO. So for workforce users, there's a whole bunch of wins here. Seamless access to applications, the likelihood that you'll increase application adoption and use because it's easy and you're not having to do anything more than that one MFA ceremony and you're in that portal and you can access any of those applications that you are provisioned to. Um, you can eliminate that password fatigue, which makes people very unhappy, but also those bad habits around password reuse. Um, it's of course flexible. You can use that application portal from anywhere at any time, assuming that uh, you have those working hours set in the policy and save a ton of time by not having to go and think about, I have to VPN in, then I have to do this step, then I have to do that step, or I'm not allowed to do it at all and I actually have to go into the office in order to access certain applications. And again, at the end of the day, it really simplifies that multi-factor authentication experience all up. So you're not getting prompted for every single uh, application that you want to sign into, um, whether it be for the password or for an MFA ceremony. For businesses and organizations, it's really beneficial for reducing and preventing shadow IT. So lots of users subscribe to lots of different free accounts for different types of reasons. Um, and this really can help creating that portal can really help um, you see which applications are being used, but also drive your users to using the corporate approved applications that you expect them to use because you actually have policies that are managing that access and also so what happens with the data. Um, you'll also be able to rapidly replace and deploy new applications. So if one collaboration product doesn't work for you, you can pretty quickly swap it out with the, within minutes, quite honestly, and, and set up a new uh, SSO you know, ceremony with a new application and drop that, that, that icon into the application portal, and, and it's just going to work for users. Um, again, it also really can help reduce those password resets um, or the fact that there is the potential for account lockout. Um, you can enable, of course, uh, flexible work anywhere without compromising security, and that includes those temporary workers and contractors that we talked about. And last but not least, which is really, really key to why do you do any access control, is really around achieving zero trust and verifying that every user access request is verified. All right. So as you think about uh, where you want to be as a managed service provider down the road, you may already be in the business of supporting uh, MFA as an example in your um, services and offerings. And you may if you are an off-point uh, seller and, and supporter, um, you may be using the use cases that are most common, like VPN access, for example. However, if you take a step back, you really need to think about what that user experience is like and whether you really want people tunneling in and out of a network, um, depending on the scenario. So. From a zero trust perspective, you don't really want that. What you do want is to ask questions of your end customers like how many applications do you typically use on a daily basis? Or how many end users do you manage overall? Because once you start to get into larger numbers of users, um, not having SSO actually becomes very burdensome as you think about application sprawl that tends to occur and that shadow IT challenge that exists. Um, and then really those use cases, continuing to enable and support secure and hybrid workforce, um, or again, those, those temporary uh, contractors and vendors that need those project-based access from time to time. And then really stepping back and thinking about how you manage um, secure applications and data access for all end user types, whether it be admins, employees, workforce, or in the case of student and faculty or parents as well involved in that whole scenario, um, you can really start to think about how you're delivering value uh, to that 
those end customers, holistically thinking about all of those use cases, and then start to think about evolving the way you're going to go to market from a services offering. So SSO as a service could be based on things like packages that you build around enabling 10 apps at a time, really you know, getting those small businesses engaged and seeing the benefits and the values at value of the 10 applications that are most meaningful to them and really build a, a model around 20 apps, 50 apps, or an unlimited offering that, you know, you set a price point for. You can base it on users, whether there's 50 users or 250 users or by the number of apps or combine the two. Um, really thinking about what works best for your uh, your current you know, customer base, but also where you want to grow. And then last but not least, really focusing on those use cases, whether it's those uh, remote use cases, those hybrid con or contractors, or if you want to move away from VPN into your network because you understand that that is opening up uh, potential risks for lateral movement and just unnecessary privileges that you don't want to see given to too many employees. Um, and constraining it to an application portal where really it's about the apps and not so much about the network. Um, and, and of course, helping your customers see the hidden savings through things like the reduction of password resets or ticketing, um, the time it takes for a user to wait for um, a resolution, or even the time savings that they have with not having to have, again, 10, 15, 20 passwords and applications that they have to use every single day. All right, so in summary, our closing thoughts around the hidden value. The, your customer is investing in end user productivity or the workforce experience and secure access management. And really that's the thing that is re really part of the hidden value of SSO is it's not just security, it's really that end user productivity message that sometimes gets lost in um, the discussions around cybersecurity threats and what the motive or driver would be for you to ch change the way you're doing something. You're really opening up that secure access management experience, but it comes with really great security when it comes to fronting it with MFA and also constraining the applications with those zero trust policies as we talked about today. So with that, we're at the end of our session and we have time for some questions. And I think that you probably have a couple for me, Liz. Yes. So one question is, if you don't want to use an application portal, can you use it per application? Oh, Carla, I think you got muted. I did. Thank you. I apologize. Yes. So you can also do MFA and SSO on a per application basis. So you can build the same sign in splash page that you saw to the application portal that I was sort of showing. You can have that also um, very simply done for just a single application and not require the application portal. So for example, um, if Salesforce is the most important application for you, you can you can just focus on sales, enabling Salesforce um, and, of course, putting MFA in front of that so that uh, someone unauthorized isn't accessing all of your potential op, you know, sales opportunities. Awesome. Thank you. And another question just came in. How do the applications know what user accounts to use? Oh, so there's a provisioning process that's behind this as well, which I did not describe, which starts with syncing your identities in the first place, whether they come from a, a cloud directory like Entra or Azure Active Directory, or if you use WatchGuard's directory service as well. There's a provisioning aspect that starts with first creating the account for the user, then adding the account to the subscription service, and then enabling the SSO experience. So there's some workflow that starts up front that kicks off that provisioning experience. There's also provisioning capabilities, something called SCIM, S-C-I-M, which can do the provisioning automated on your behalf to any one of those target applications as well. So there's a manual way of doing it. There's a uh, automated way through an open standards protocol called SKIM, as well as there's ways for you to just bulk upload the, you know, the, the list of user accounts that you want to provision to say Salesforce as an example in the administrative experience. Awesome, thank you. It looks like those are the two that were submitted. Uh, maybe we can give the audience 
a minute um, to submit any last minute questions uh, before calling it a day. Cool. Yeah. All right. No other questions. Doesn't look like anything is coming through, but of course, people can always reach out to you um, if they have any questions. You bet. That's exactly right. So um, after the replay is available on demand, feel free to reach out to us if you have any other follow-ups. You can find me on LinkedIn as well, Carla Roncato, uh, at WatchGuard Technology, Vice President of Identity here. Um, feel free to reach out anytime. Awesome. Thank you so much, Carla. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>